Right, I will briefly talk about Mixsass. Um, if I use the right keyboard for this. There we go. Uh, Mixsass is a program that, uh, that I worked on together with Ingo. Um, it's something that I uh, developed uh, during my time at Spring 8 because we came across data sets that I couldn't fit with, uh, with classical models anymore. Um, so just take a step back. There are three general ways available that you can fit data. There is the outdated way. That's just a linearization that you saw in many papers before computers became ubiquitous. This is where you transform your data by taking, for example, the logarithm of the intensity and then taking Q squared. And then you should end up with a linear region somewhere which you can, uh, which, which you can try and describe. Now this is this has been likened by uh, Professor Almond Strebeck as reading tea leaves, and of course the age of reading tea leaves has passed. So I expect not to see any linearized plots anymore uh, from anyone in this course. Um, then there is the uh, more classical way, well, the classical way that, that that came up in the 1990s, where you do least squares fitting to models. Um, you can use the packages SASView or SASFIT for this. Both of them uh, offer least squares fitting. Uh, however, um, uh, using slightly different interfaces and uh, giving you slightly, slightly different options. You might like one better than the other. Um, so uh, try and play around with both and see which ones you are most comfortable with. Um, this will usually fit most of your data quite well and um, uh, give you good parameters for, for series as well. However, you can get cases in which your data is not fitted well anymore. Um, that is when you go outside of the constraints imposed on you by this uh, least squares fitting. Um, for example, in terms of size distributions, if your particle size distribution is not a Gaussian or is not a log normal or is not a schultz sim. Uh, and cannot be described with any of these standard ones, then you need something else. And there have been a couple of approaches uh, proposed in the past uh, with inverse Fourier transforms, uh, reverse Monte Carlo um, uh, procedures, uh, and other inversion methods, which can take your data and invert it uh, to give you information out. Uh, we programmed one of these. It is uh, called Maxas. Um, this can fit most data sets very well uh, to within the uncertainty of the data and uh, gives you out a size distribution of your object. So you have to tell it, in this case, um, what shape your scatterer is, and then it will give you a size distribution. Um, this can be useful, for example, or has been useful in the study of uh, quantum dot formation. Um, where Benjamin Abacassis well, had done some um, uh, X-ray scattering experiments at the synchrotron and could not fit the, his data. Now he was interested in knowing uh, by what mechanism these quantum dots grow, um, and he collected all these scattering patterns and then tried to fit them uh, using Maxas. He uh, managed to get all these uh, all these distributions out, and you see that in this growth process there is actually. You start with one, with one population and then it splits into two populations and eventually uh, one of the two populations grows uh, to larger sizes and the other population just reduces in, uh, in volume fraction. So this, uh, this complete data set for the entire synthesis could not be, um, could not be fitted using a consistent, uh, consistent model in the least squares fitting. Now with Maxas you can get population statistics out. So then you can. Uh, what he did was to um, to convert this information into uh, information on the um, on the mean particle size, on the yield, on the part, uh, on the uh, polydispersity, uh, and on the concentration. And that way he could exclude two different formation mechanisms, uh, and since he could, uh, since there were only three possible formation mechanisms of these quantum dots, he could say, okay, since we've excluded two of them, um, we are now confident that this is the formation, uh, uh, the formation mechanism for these particular quantum dots. It's one of the few cases where we could actually prove that it was one formation mechanism um, 
uh, because no normally it's very hard to prove anything outside of mathematics. Um, another nice case was that of magnesium zinc alloys. Uh, this was done together with a colleague of mine who was an expert in electron microscopy on metals, uh, Julian Rosalie. And he had prepared a very nice series of magnesium zinc alloys uh, where if you age these alloys, uh, you get these cylindrical precipitates growing along one, uh, one dimension, one, one crystal dimension. So I measured those scattering patterns on a laboratory instrument uh, with different uh, aging times. And as, uh, as you increase the aging times, you get more and more of the cylinders and they also grow to different sizes. We need one piece of information. As I said, uh, we need to know the shape of the scatterers. In this case, we're fairly confident that the average scatterer is a cylindrical shape. And we needed to know what orientation this is in in the sample. So in this case, it's not completely isotropic, but within our disc-shaped samples, these cylinders were, um, uh, were planar isotropic, right? So they, they were oriented randomly within that plane, but they were not sticking uh, towards you or away from you. Um, so with that information, we could fit this data. Uh, we could fit each data set very well again, and we got, we got size distributions out. So from small angle X-ray scattering, uh, those size distributions are shown in red. Uh, from electron microscopy, uh, my colleague painstakingly measured 500 precipitates for each one of these uh, aging times. And you can see that those two actually matches quite, uh, match quite easily. However, his average was over 500 precipitates. Our average was over billions and billions of precipitates. So together, these two techniques actually work super nicely. We could also get information on the volume fraction of precipitates since we measure an absolute unit. And we could follow the growth of these precipitates uh, based on the aging time. We then also did some uh, in situ studies uh, with an oven, and we found that that growth rate is actually slightly different. And this has to do with the different heating rates of those uh, um, of the different setups. We do ex situ experiments. You throw your metal alloy into an oil bath, so heating is very quick. In situ, we have to wait for our heating stage to 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 uh, to rise up in temperature, and that uh, apparently affects the kinetics quite dramatically. Um, however, in situ, we can very easily change the temperature and see what, uh, how that affects the growth uh, principles of these, uh, of these precipitates. So, yeah, the underneath, uh, Maxas actually works quite, uh, quite straightforwardly. Um, it can fit very nice data using an iterative Monte Carlo procedure, uh, where it gradually uh, tries to improve the match between the uh, between the the model data and the measured data. Um, so as I said, this usually works quite well uh, to a reduced chi square of less uh, less or equal to one than one, which means that we have described our data to within the uncertainty, which means there is no more information to be obtained from this. Um, the size distributions come with uncertainties as well. Uh, these can be helpful when you're trying to match your result with the result from other techniques, such as electron microscopy, um, where you can try and find out whether those results match to within the uncertainty. Uh, that really is the value of your data, these uncertainties. Now, the model intensity in this, um, uh, in this Monte Carlo procedure is described as the sum of uh, the form factor of about 200 or 300 spheres. So here I have 200 spheres. Um, they are volume weighted within Maxas, uh, or actually inverse volume weighted. And what happens is that Maxas then takes one of these uh, spherical form factors, tries to change it, its radius, and if that change in radius does not improve the match between the, the model and the data, that change is rejected. And the original is put back in place. Um, if, however, that change does lead to an improvement in match between the model and the intensity, it is kept. And that is really as simple as it is. Um, so that set of spheres then describes our model intensity, and we can uh, histogram that set of spheres to get a, an idea about the size distribution out. And then when we let the optimization run, you can see that this uh, gradually 
changes the radii of the spheres, um, and our distribution basically walks over uh, to, to the right distribution, or to a solution for that distribution. Um, so, does it work? Well, we tested this out on a lot of things. So what I did is I um, came up with a couple of arbitrary distributions. Here I have a pentamodal distribution. That, uh, um, then I generated um, a, uh, or I simulated a scattering pattern for, from that distribution. And then I let Maxas loose on that simulated scattering pattern to, get, to try and retrieve the original size distribution. So you see that works quite well for if you throw a pentamodal distribution out of it, you get five modes out again. Likewise, if you have not, uh, not uh, monodispersed modes, but if you have polydispersed modes, that uh, is retrieved quite well as well, uh, without any further information other than these are spheres. Um, you can have broad distributions, you can have uh, mixes between uh, uh, monodispersed distributions and triangular distributions. Um, you can have uh, tailing distributions out there, uh, you can have uniform distributions. And the uniform distribution is a nice case because if you look at the scattering pattern at the top, you will actually see this is what is usually fitted with a fractal model, right? Um, you can imagine, well, this is actually quite similar to a fractal model because we've got large structures which are very similar to the small structures that we're modeling over here. But this just ties in with what I said on day one, that um, that you can either, uh, that I can model um, the scattering of a fractal structure as, uh, as scattering from a polydispersed system. So you really need to know whether you have a fractal in there or whether you have a polydisperse uh, uh, system in your um, in your sample. So let me show the basic use of MixSAS and for that I will actually switch to my other computer uh, because I had some issues with getting the data set across. I think if I share here it will take me out of the other one. Share. Uh, share. Good. Right. Um, so here I have. Um, so when I load my SAS, this is the window that it comes up with. I hope that's uh, that's well visible for anyone. Um, it's a fairly straightforward interface. It says right click to load to load files. So if I right click, it says load data files. I can do that. I can load a data file, say um, uh, silver n zero zero eight. I click open. This is in the uh, in the simple data sets, um, and there we have uh, uh, we get some information on on this data, where the queues where it starts in queue, where it ends in queue, and how that transforms to an estimated sphere size. Right um, now, there are a couple of panels here: uh, data settings, optimization, model, and post fit analysis. Um, I can. If you first use this, you can skip data settings. I think they should be set to reasonable values. Um, you can skip the optimization. That should also be set to a reasonable value. Important here is the convergence criterion. That is the reduced chi-square when Maxas will say, OK, I've described the data, I will stop. Um, and the number of repetitions. I've set this to two, so you will actually um, uh, see a result in a reasonable time. Um, then we have the model panel. This is uh, by default set to sphere. We have a couple of models here, some which work, some which don't work so well. Um, and for each model, you can set a minimum and a maximum value for that uh, for that object, right? Um, however, if I'm very lazy and I don't want to copy the numbers from the estimated sphere size into my model, I can also double click on this line and th those values get filled in automatically. Uh, I can fill in a scattering length density difference because we're actually working in absolute units um, and we can work in absolute units. So I will just pick out um, gold in water. I have, I have an Excel sheet where I keep some of the most common scattering length density differences. And I see that that is 115 times 10 to the minus 6. So I will fill that in here. So it's 115 times 10 to the minus 6. Right. Um, with that set, I can click start 
and this thing should start optimizing. Um, I don't know how quick it will optimize because I, of course, tried out the other example earlier on. Um, but you can see as it is optimizing, the, the chi-square gradually uh, reduces and hopefully it will reach one, right? If your uncertainty estimates are correct, then this will reach one at some point, and that means you have successfully optimized one, um, uh, you've successfully obtained one um, solution to your scattering pattern. What Maxas then does is it creates a new random set of spheres and it optimizes that. So by repeatedly optimizing um, or by repeatedly getting new solutions and by comparing the overlap between those solutions, we then estimate our uncertainties. So that's one way uh, for Gudrun, for example, to, to know that you're not in, a, not in a local minimum, but in a global minimum, is to analyze these uncertainties. Uh, it's basically the difference between the different optimizations that you have. So here we see that we, my apologies, here we see that we've actually matched our data quite well. Uh, here we have a distribution in a, with a linear radius axis, and here we have a distribution with a logarithmic radius axis. And we can see that we have one population in here, which is, uh, if I click on the right place, there we go, uh, which has uh, a mean radius of 3.4 nanometers, so a mean diameter of about 7. Um, and from the variance, you can calculate the width of this distribution. You take the square root of the variance is the, is, is, uh, the Gaussian width. Um, and I don't have a calculator here, so I can't do that quickly. Uh, skew and kurtosis are more population uh, statistics that tell you how, uh, how lopsided your distribution is. And kurtosis tells you how, how tailing these are. However, these are the third and fourth modes of this distribution, and the uncertainty on those is usually quite large. Um, so, yeah, you can do this automatically on series of files. Uh, these, all of these, all of this information is exported to text files, so you can later on load them in uh, in Python and show the uh, progression of these populations over your series of samples that you've measured. Um, if I briefly go back to Maxas, uh, to sorry, the presentation, um, then uh, okay, sure. there we go. And swap out my screen. Um, then um, there are a couple of pitfalls that I should make you aware of. Uh, first one is data quality. Maxas will fit anything you throw at it, even if your data is incorrect. It will also fit it. The quality of your result, however, is directly proportional to the quality of your input. So if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. Right? And that is also the reason why we developed this very comprehensive data correction procedure, so that we, we can be confident through rigor um, that the data that we put into Maxas is as correct as we can get it. Right? Then there is ambiguity in the system. Uh, this is something that we explained on day one. Uh, I can fit this scattering pattern um, using spheres. And it fits perfectly well, and I get a particular size distribution out. However, this is from one of the magnesium zinc alloys that I showed earlier on. These are not spheres. These are actually cylinders. Uh, if I change my shape to cylinders, it fits perfectly well. The difference in result between these two is that if you fit with spheres, you get this distribution. And if you fit with cylinders, you get this distribution. Uh, but both of these are, in principle, valid solutions to, um, to your scattering pattern. So you, uh, this means that you need to provide information on the shape of your particles. Um, I've also simulated this. I can have monodispersed ellipsoids with an aspect ratio of 2. Um, and I can fit those with spheres. I can have an aspect ratio of 20. I can fit those with spheres. I can have an aspect ratio of one uh, of half. So basically, oblate ellipsoids, right? Uh, sort of thick, uh, thick disc-like ones. Um, same with one twentieth. That still fits. So just to highlight, between shape, polydispersity, and um, uh, and packing, there can really be only one unknown between these three. So think of the Highlander, there can be only one. Um, 
you have to input the other two when you uh, when you start fitting your data. So if you want to know the polyp dispersity, uh, the size distribution of your uh, of your um, of the structure that you're measuring, you have to input information on the packing and the shape of these uh, of these particles. Um, this I will skip over uh, as there's a unidirectional uh, um, fitability, I would say, um, but basically whenever whenever you're trying to fit scattering patterns, try to fit scattering patterns knowing uh, beforehand what kind of shape you have. Um, there are some advanced uses you have in Maxas, uh, especially now that uh, Maxas 3 is programmed. Uh, Maxas 3 is a refactored version of Maxas, which has uh, which doesn't have the nice user interface, unfortunately, but it solves a lot of problems that the original Maxas had. So um, if you want to use Maxas in an advanced way, I would recommend using Maxas 3, especially if you have if you're familiar with Python and you're comfortable in Python. Um, you can code your own models in Maxas. Uh, if there's a shape or a structure that you want to um, fit in a Monte Carlo approach, you can uh, add your own models to the library. Um, you can add smearing. So if you have slit smeared systems, you can uh, or pinhole smeared systems, and you would like to include that instrumental smearing in your fit, Maxas lets you do that. Um, and with Maxas three, uh, at least we have multi-core fitting. Uh, uh, and rehistogramming implemented there as well. Uh, and 2D fitting is also possible for these things. So if you have anisotropic scattering patterns, you can actually, uh, so the anisotropic scattering pattern on the left here, you can actually iteratively fit those scattering patterns uh, using Maxas and get information on the uh, radius distribution, on the length distribution, and on the orientation distribution of your scatterers. Um, this is quite a lengthy procedure, uh, so it's not something that I would recommend um, starting with. But if you have nice anisotropic data, as shown on the left, you can get some extra information out with this.